Welcome to Focus on Albany. I'm Cynthia Pooler. My guest today is David Lombardo from the Capitol Press Room. And David is going to talk about the Republican State Convention. So, David, did you have as much fun with the Republicans as you did with the Democrats? Uh, not to sound too partisan, but I think I might have had more fun at the uh, Republican convention, Cynthia. The convention was, I'd say, less scripted and a little more uh, open. So as a reporter, that meant I had a lot more access to the politicians who are running for office. We spoke with every single statewide candidate, uh, as opposed to on the Democratic side, where we didn't get access to the establishment candidates, uh, the governor, uh, the lieutenant governor, the attorney general, uh, all did not make themselves available. I had a brief uh, interaction with Comptroller Tom DiNapoli at their convention. But on the Republican side, no, they were making themselves very accessible. I think that's a product of the fact that they've got nothing to lose uh, by making themselves accessible and they want as much media attention as possible. So that made it for a, a more interesting environment. But also there was more of an air of unpredictability, I think, at the Republican state convention, even though Congressman Lee Zeldin won 85% uh, or a little bit more of the weighted vote in the terms of the party's endorsement for uh, their nomination for governor. Um, but it still felt different, I think, in part because they let all the candidates speak. Uh, and that created some drama because we didn't know what these statewide candidates, the, the non-establishment ones, would say with their time. Would they try to burn the party down? Would they just try to make a, a broad appeal? One of the attorney general candidates actually used his time to drop out and back the establishment candidate. So that added a little bit of, of drama. So all in all, those two elements really contributed to a more fun uh, experience for me as a reporter. So um, Zeldin got 85% of the weighted vote. Um, do you think it's going to be a contested, a contested primary? Do you think it's going to get mean and vicious? Or do you think it's going to be a friendly type thing? Well, if this was Ronald Reagan's Republican Party, I think we would say that we live by, what was it, the 11th uh, commandment, thou shalt right. not speak ill of our fellow Republicans or, or some mm -hmm. deviation uh, of that. But no, we've already seen that, uh, for instance, Westchester County, exec, former Westchester County Executive Rob Astorino has no problems uh, hitting Lee Zeldin for his time in the state Senate, where he was a member of a very slim and narrow majority of Republicans who made some compromises with then Governor Andrew Cuomo and Rob Estorino was hitting Lee Zeldin for some of those. He was doing that minutes after the endorsement uh, from the party went for Lee Zeldin. So I, I think that the party will see a little bit of infighting. How contentious it will be remains to be seen, in part because we don't know who's actually going to be on the Republican primary ballot, while Lee Zeldin is automatically qualified by the amount of support he got at the party's convention. The other hopefuls, whether it's Rob Estorino, who we mentioned, uh, businessman Harry Wilson, who entered the race very late, or Andrew Giuliani, son of uh, Rudy Giuliani, uh, it remains to be seen whether they'll actually be able to qualify for the ballot, which is a process that can be pretty cumbersome without the party's support. You need to collect more than 50,000 signatures to make it onto the ballot. They need to come from congressional districts all, all over the state. and you need a lot of infrastructure to make that happen. So it remains to be seen whether someone like Andrew Giuliani, who doesn't necessarily have the same campaign apparatus or experience as Rob Astorino, uh, will be able to make the, the primary ballot. Uh, once April, early April rolls around, we'll have a better idea of who's actually on the ballot. And in those final two months, we'll get to see how this race really takes shape because then, you know, I think candidates will tailor their messages based on what the field looks like. You'll look and see if I'm Harry Wilson, what's my lane to victory look like? What do I have to do to execute that pathway? And maybe it means going hard at Lee Zeldin. Maybe it means just being the nice guy. Uh, same for Andrew Giuliani, same for Rob Astorino. So I guess we'll see what this will shape up to be once we know what the ballot looks like. The Republican state chairman, uh, Nick Langworthy, 
he he decided on Zeldin pretty early. Um, what do you think that is? I think Zeldin is an attractive candidate to the establishment, in part because he announced early on he was early out of the gate in, in this race, I think more than a year ago at this point, he was ready to take on uh, then Governor Andrew Cuomo, whereas some of these candidates have emerged really late. So you have that aspect of things. You have that stability that is really attractive to a party that's looking for someone who can build up a base of support. So Lee Zeldin has been around the state multiple times now, and I think that's got to be attractive to Chairman Langworthy, who says, okay, here's a guy who's serious about this. They're building up a base of support, and they're you know, potentially going to have something to build on come the general election. I think Lee Zeldin is also attractive because as a member of Congress, he has shown an ability to raise a lot of money. And Republicans in and of themselves don't necessarily do a good job of raising money in New York, in part because people don't want to give to the likely losers. But if Lee Zeldin can tap money outside of New York, uh, then I think that's really attractive. Lee Zeldin also comes from a district, while not necessarily as blue as some Republicans like to make it out to be, it is a competitive congressional district. So there is this idea that he can win in non-hard red communities, and that's what it takes to win as a Republican in a statewide election in New York. You're going to have to appeal to some Democratic voters, some independent voters. You need to win big in the New York City suburbs. Lee Zeldin's from the New York City suburbs, uh, coming from Long Island. So I think all of that contributes to the idea that he is an attractive candidate. And that explains why Langworthy uh, rallied around him. But that's not to say he was necessarily Langworthy's first choice. Harry Wilson, the businessman I mentioned, has been the Republicans' dream candidate ever since 2010, when he narrowly lost uh, to controller Tom DiNapoli, I think it was five or six points at most. And Langworthy had a conversation with Zeldin a year ago about trying to get him into this race. And I think if Wilson had jumped then, as opposed to days before the convention, I think we would have seen a different calculus by Langworthy. I think he would have said, here's a guy who not only uh, might be able to raise money, but could self-fund his campaign to a certain degree. So when that didn't materialize, I think Zeldin looked pretty good to, to Langworthy for all the reasons we talked about. But um, it seems as if Zeldin is more or less aligning himself with Donald Trump. And, to a certain degree. And Donald Trump is not exactly the most popular guy in New York State. That's one way of saying it. <laughs> so do you think that being a Trumper will ultimately hurt Zeldin. I think that there is a tightrope that Lee Zeldin is going to try to walk uh, through the primary and then into the general election if he is the party's nominee. Like you said, Donald Trump is not the most popular politician in New York. I think it's in the low 30s for a favorability rating at, at best. But Lee Zeldin has had... I would say a on again, off again relationship with Donald Trump. When Donald Trump was uh, on the rise, when he was president, Lee Zeldin had his back. He was his guy 100%. Now that Donald Trump is persona non grata uh, nationally uh, and really is only embraced by more of the hardcore elements in his party, I think Zeldin has read the tea leaves and said, okay, let's back off a little bit. But I think he's also cognizant of the fact that in a Republican primary, Donald Trump is still going to be very popular with some of the voters who are going to decide this primary election. So he needs to be careful about alienating Donald Trump too much because you have a candidate like Andrew Giuliani, who if make, he makes it onto the ballot, will wrap himself up in, in Donald Trump. He will stress the fact that he worked in the Trump administration. So when I talk about that tightrope, Lee Zeldin needs to be careful not to alienate Trump supporters while also not embracing him too much if he wants to be serious uh, about a general election. Because as Democrats have shown 
uh, since 2016, there's nothing they like to do better than run against Donald Trump. It was the message in 2018. It was the message in 2020. And I, I think that in 2021, one of the reasons why Democrats struggled in some of these purple areas is that they didn't have that message to run against. They couldn't really campaign solely against Donald Trump. And when they had to you know, go on the offensive, it, it didn't really work. And it was the Republicans who were able to go on the offensive. So I, I think that this is something that he's going to have to be careful of because he doesn't want to give Democrats too much ammunition. One one uh, person I w I've been looking at is um, John Katko. Mm -hmm. John Katko is retiring from Congress. But John Katko came out really early and talked about the student loan debt crisis where a lot of other incumbents did not. And my my guess, my feeling, maybe I'm wrong, is I think if Katko was the nominee on the Republican side, he would have gotten a lot of votes from people who have student debt, and he could possibly have succeeded better than the candidates that are there now. What do you think of my theory? So I think that Katko definitely has more cross party appeal than some of the Republican hopefuls who are actually running for governor. But I think there is a limit to that appeal. So you talk about his position on student loan debt. I don't think it differentiates him from Democratic candidates. So I think that if I'm a voter, especially a young voter who cares about an issue like student debt, then I'm going to gravitate towards the Democratic candidate who already has my back on this issue. I think Katko and his appeal stems from the fact that he presents himself as this even-handed uh, Republican who's willing to compromise, who has actually rebuked his party. And I think that kind of message resonates with independent voters. But I think his problem is ultimately that he has no place in a, in a Republican primary, especially a one-on-one -on -one matchup. Maybe he could win a statewide crowded field, but there's going to be a, or would be a tax on him as being a rhino Republican name only, even though Democrats would then chastise him as being some sort of hardcore radical Republican, which he's not, but it's a label that they would still try to stick to him. So I think maybe 30 years ago, if we were talking about the 1994 gubernatorial election, John Katko would have a lot of appeal. And there's a Republican Party that would rally around him as the candidate who made sense in a statewide election. But uh, I think the fact that he didn't look to run for governor, the fact that he didn't look to run for U.S. Senate speaks to the fact that he's able to read the room and the sense of where his party is, not just nationally, but in, in New York, and can tell that there's really not a place for him in it. But, you know, he's raising an issue that affects mm -hmm. many people in the state of New York as well as nationwide. You would think that that message would resonate, but you're saying that it really doesn't? Well, I'm saying that the people who care about it already have champions who are willing to go to bat for it. So I would argue that the way Congressman Katko thinks about approaches, talks about student loans is no different than the way Democratic candidates he might run against uh, would talk about it. Uh, and as such, I think that the people who care about those issues, who are often younger, often more liberal, uh, won't gravitate toward him because of his position on that one issue. I think they would also care about uh, other things that he might not measure up to for them. And ultimately, it's a stumbling block. I, I, you know, you make a good point that this is something that people care about because it, it costs them potentially tens of thousands of dollars uh, each year. It can really dramatically impact uh, someone's livelihood. It impacts their career choices. So it's something people care about, but I just don't think he's the lone savior that people can turn to uh, on this issue. So where was the, uh, the state convention? It was in Garden City, 
on Long, Long Island. Island. Okay. And I, I need to stress that I was on Long Island. I was no, it wasn't in Long Island. That right. was the one thing I was very careful not to, to say uh, during the two day convention on February 28th and March 1st. Mm -hmm. I'm from Long Island, so I know exactly what you're talking about. Yes. So how far, I, I don't remember, I've been up, uh, up here many years. How far is that from New York City? That's a great question. And if I had my MapQuest uh, app open or Google Maps open, I could probably tell you, but it didn't seem like it was very far, maybe 20 minutes uh, tops uh, from Queens. Uh, in terms of a drive, it was not bad uh, on the way back. Although uh, on the way there, I uh, took a pit stop in New Haven to visit my sibling uh, as a chance to see them. So it was nice to be able to do that uh, over the weekend. But I, I think um, the symbolism for the Republicans of this location is that it's in Nassau County, and that's where the Republicans made some significant inroads in 2021, winning the uh, county executive's job, winning the uh, DA's race, uh, taking some uh, big municipalities within Nassau County. And, and the message that Chairman Langworthy was trying to resonate uh, with the people there and the media was, we're here because you guys have created the blueprint, have some sort of roadmap that leads to victory, and we're going to follow it in 2022. And there is some sense to that. Nassau County is not uh, deep, deep blue. It's not deep, deep red. It is a, a purple county for the most part. And, and as such, there could be some lessons to be had from it. But I also think Long Island, as you know, having grown up there, is a bit of a, an anomaly and that uh, it isn't necessarily representative of the state as a whole. And it's definitely not representative of what uh, New York City voters are going to do, because a Democrat in Nassau County probably approaches elections a lot differently than a Democrat in Brooklyn or a Democrat in Manhattan. And while Republicans were able to make inroads with them in 2021 in their local elections, it's unlikely that the same messaging is going to resonate with those Democrats in Manhattan, Brooklyn, uh, the Bronx. Um, so I think the analogy only goes so far. So you said that the Republican convention was fun. What made it different than, you know, the Democratic convention? Why did you have more fun with the Republicans than the Democrats? Well, like I mentioned at the top, the Democratic convention was heavily, heavily scripted. It was definitely a more well orchestrated show. It was a pageantry. Uh, we had better videos, better uh, graphics, better uh, music. Uh, it was obvious that they spent more money on it. Uh, production values were just better. And while that might make for a better experience for the convention goers who are all jazzed up by that, I'm a cynical reporter, Cynthia, and I try not to get uh, too excited or swayed by a lot of that stuff. And I actually find the almost uh, makeshift nature of the Republican convention, the idea of uh, the little rascals getting together to put on a play, uh, almost more appealing. Uh, and there was also just really tight quarters at the Republican state convention. Maybe that was a consequence of the space they chose. Maybe it was a consequence of the fact that uh, COVID restrictions had been relaxed a bit. And, and as such, you're really bumping up on all of these uh, people throughout the convention, whereas the Democratic event held at the Sheridan in Manhattan was a little more spread out. Um, and uh, that just made for, I guess, a different environment. Uh, although as a reporter, again, you know, for me, the nice part was getting a chance in, in the evenings to commiserate a little bit with my, my colleagues who you know, we, we spend plenty of time during the day chatting, but uh, it was nice to uh, get dinner in Manhattan and enjoy a drink uh, on Long Island and just to relax and unwind a little bit uh, on the, the first night of both those conventions. Mm -hmm. So um, so you, you enjoyed both of them. It's, yes. it's the political junkie's dream, right? <laughs> there, there's lots of lawn signs you can get, lots of tchotchkes. There were Lee Zeldin stickers that I may have grabbed a couple of uh, as keepsakes. Uh, I think I grabbed a Lee Zeldin lawn sign, which if people are watching, you know, they can see it. It'll have a place on my wall uh, eventually. 
And uh, it was the same thing for the Democratic convention. We were picking up uh, lawn signs. Mm -hmm. I don't think we got any shirts, though. I got a towel from the Nassau County uh, Republicans, um, things that'll be treasured. And, and, you know, just the uh, badges that we got are things that I have hanging from my uh, rearview mirror in in my car. So, yeah, as a political junkie, you can't beat it. It's uh, a lot of fun. Good thing you you took your car to bring back all that paraphernalia, right? Yeah, it was a little bit awkward uh, thinking about how to get that out of Manhattan. So both both the uh, Governor Hochul and L- Lee Zeldin got eighty five percent of the weighted vote. Yep. Were you surprised about that? I don't think I was surprised about either outcome, in part because heading into the conventions, a lot of the party leaders had announced their support uh, on the Democratic side for Hochul and the Republican side for Lee Zeldin. So we really knew coming in that a lot of votes had already been committed. Some of the big prizes on the Republican side that were still up for grabs heading into the convention was the Westchester County delegation. They had kind of sat on their hands, and that was because the former county executive, Rob Astorino, comes uh, from there. And on the day of the convention, we had a little bit of drama in terms of getting to actually watch the county committees go up and announce their votes. And some of them said, hi, we're... uh, so Orange County, and we're split uh, partially for Lee Zeldin, partially for Astorino. And so that was a little bit of drama, um, only created because of the weighted vote. We didn't actually get that on the Democratic side because they used uh, technology to basically let everybody enter uh, their vote via a, a clicker. So all the votes just sort of appeared on a board and then they were announced. So you didn't get any of that drama that was built in uh, on the Republican side. And I use the word drama kind of loosely because while it was exciting, the stakes weren't super high because we still, like I said, knew which way it was ultimately going to go. It was just a question of, is anyone gonna be able to peel off some votes? I I think on the Democratic side, the interesting narrative is that uh, Jumani Williams, the New York City public advocate, who was able to get 6% of the uh, weighted vote when he ran for lieutenant governor in 2018, was able to grow his support to 12% uh, this time around. There's cases to be made on both sides, whether that's good or uh, inadequate. Um, You know, being able to double is always a positive, uh, but he fell short of the 25% threshold. He would need to automatically qualify for the ballot, which is the threshold that, you know, Democratic chair Jay Jacobs had kind of tried to set as the bar for him so that uh, anything less would be a failure. And I think on the Republican side, there had been some discussion uh, or consideration or maybe just hope from the non-establishment candidates that Nick Langworthy would open up the the process and ultimately decide it's best for the party to give everyone the 25% threshold that they need to automatically qualify for the ballot to make sure that there are no no hurt feelings. But ultimately, uh, there was a calculation by Nick Langworthy and the party establishment more broadly that uh, the rules are the rules for a reason and that they have a vested interest in in trying to rally behind uh, one candidate uh, early in the process. It seems like Curtis Sliwa had a pretty visible presence throughout the two days. Were you surprised that he was as visible as he was? No, not really. He was the Republican candidate for mayor of the largest city uh, in New York. Uh, He has a high profile to begin with, but there wasn't like there were a lot of Republicans running around trying to kiss his ring. I think he was there uh, on the second day when they did the gubernatorial endorsements. Uh, That was his real big moment to shine. Uh, I got the impression that uh, he would have liked to have been more of a kingmaker than he actually uh, was or got an opportunity to be. I think Rudy Giuliani's presence was a bigger deal than seeing Curtis. I think uh, governor, former Governor George Pataki's presence was a bigger deal than, than Curtis, in part because 
Pataki represents the, the dream of Republicans. He actually won a, a big election, whereas Curtis merely ran. So I, I think that uh, when we think about where the party was trying to focus and highlight, it was those those winners, those uh, people like Pataki who won in, in statewide or Rudy Giuliani who, who won across New York City. Uh, so that was really where a lot of the attention went. So we just have a couple of minutes left, Dave. Why don't you why don't you give yourself a little plug, talk about your radio show, where it's aired and stuff? Okay. Well, you should check out our website, which is capitalpressroom.org, and all of our content ends up on our website. And while at the website, you can also find a schedule for when the show airs on the radio, in which we are syndicated on stations all over New York, uh, airing from different times from five in the capital region to, I believe, 11 in Rochester. And you can also download the show as a podcast wherever you currently download your favorite shows. And next week, uh, looks like we'll be talking with the Department of Environmental Conservation about a project uh, dealing with the migration of frogs and salamanders. We talked with the Times Union's Josh Solomon about an effort to fix the capital steps. Uh, and we also have a discussion about efforts to uh, rein in uh, judges in New York and talk to the commission that's accountable for keeping them in check. So it sounds like we're going to have a lot of fun and there's going to be a lot of stories about the budget uh, from here until March 31st and beyond. Speaking about the steps, ultimately, how much do you think that will cost? Well, the governor is looking to spend $41 million okay. uh, and hopefully that'll fix it for good and we won't have to invest more money. But my guess is that there will always be a need for additional funding uh, in the future. Um, we'll see. So in us, you know, upcoming uh, talks between you and I, what will be what will we be covering? We'll be covering the budget, right? Mm -hmm. We'll be covering the um, legislation that might or might not pass. Right. Yeah, that, that last couple of months before they leave for good in early June. And then we'll have the primaries to look forward to, Cynthia. It's just going to be a fun election year. That's great. So you, you've you been listening to and watching David Lombardo, Capitol Press Room. I'm Cynthia Pooler. This is Focus on Albany. If you like this show, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. David, have a great weekend, and brace yourself for another snowstorm. Oh, no. Don't say that, Cynthia. Thank you so oh, much. And we'll talk again soon. Thank you. Have a great day, and thank you, everybody, for watching and listening.